The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. <clears throat> they asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will, the si- what will be the sign that this is about to take place? Jesus said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. And Jesus said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds, not to prepare your defense in advance. For I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents, by brothers and sisters, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your heads will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. At all the Masses this weekend, we will have the great joy of celebrating the sacrament of baptism. And every baptism, no matter what, is a great day of joy for us as a parish and as a universal church, because we're witnessing the coming of the Lord into a person's life. We're witnessing the Holy Spirit being poured into their hearts, and the Holy Spirit's gifts of wisdom, understanding, right judgment, fortitude, knowledge, reverence, and fear of the Lord. It's a great day. It is a new creation. The baptism itself, like all the sacraments, is pretty simple. There's a pouring of or immersing in water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's it. The other rites that accompany it, the anointing, the white garment, the giving of the candle, the ephetha, These are explanatory rites, rituals which show us more clearly all that's happening in the moment of baptism. But one of the things I think we tend to forget about baptism, which these explanatory rites so beautifully remind us of, especially as we approach the end of the liturgical year, is that as wonderful as baptism is, and all it offers these children as they begin their Christian lives, baptism is very much about the future. Baptism is not just some churchy welcome party for an adorable baby, and yes, they are quite adorable. Baptism is a firm grasp, like a baby's grasp reflex, on the promise God holds out to us regarding our future and the end of the world. And God does promise us something about the future, much more than just good luck or have a nice life. And we renew our faith in this promise of God every Sunday when we pray the Apostles' Creed. On the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come again to judge the living and the dead. That is God's promise. He will come again as judge. Well, that doesn't sound very appealing, does it? Because judgment is a bad word in our society today. 
It's like one of the worst things you could possibly do to someone. It's like our society's original sin. But it is a sin. To judge the personal worth or moral character of someone, or even of ourselves, is a sin against the Eighth Commandment, an offense against truth. The reason why it's a sin is because, like the original sin actually, when we judge people, we're placing ourselves in, we're presuming for ourselves, we're taking for ourselves the place of God. As St. James says in his letter, there is one lawgiver and judge who is able to save and to destroy. So who then are you to judge your neighbor? To judge the personal worth, the moral character of anyone is a sin, therefore, because we're dismissing God and putting ourselves in his place. But in our post-Christian society, where God doesn't even have a place, we no longer even know why judging is wrong, only that it's wrong. <clears throat> and so for Jesus to come again and judge the living and the dead sounds to our modern post-Christian ears like Jesus is doing something wrong. Jesus is going to come and judge us? Who does he think he is? But the truth of the matter is that our non-judgmental society is in fact very judgmental. I don't need to give you any examples, but we're not exactly non-judgmental when it comes to public figures, or groups of people, or anyone actually. Not only that, every society needs judgment to function. Without lawful judges to uphold the rule of law, how will justice be done? And that's the reason why God's promise to come again to judge the living and the dead is something we should actually look forward to, even long for, because of justice. <clears throat> without a final judgment, without a final word on human history and all those unfinished stories of our lives, God would still, in a sense, owe us an answer to the question of justice. The question, why? And so the day of judgment, the day of the Lord, was something Christians and Jews alike were looking forward to. It was not going to be some mindless outbreak of global catastrophes like in the movies. The day of the Lord was above all going to be the day of vindication, the day when justice would finally be accomplished. And we hear that in our first reading, from the last book of the Old Testament, the book of the prophet Malachi. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. Catastrophe. But, but for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. Vindication. The day of the Lord will be a day both of catastrophe and vindication. The same fire of God's love, which puts an end to arrogance and evil, will bring light and healing to those who faithfully longed for justice. And Jesus' prophecy in today's gospel about the destruction of the temple is a prophecy about the day of the Lord. Dr. Brandt Petra, a Catholic scripture scholar, points out that for the Jewish people, the temple in Jerusalem was the visible point of connection between heaven and earth. Not only was it God's dwelling place among his people? Not only was it the one place to offer sacrifice to God, the Temple of Jerusalem was thought to be a microcosm of the universe, of all creation. <clears throat> In the ancient Near East, the temple of any god was thought to be the domain of that god. But God's domain, God's temple, is all of creation. And so the design of the temple in Jerusalem was meant to be a reflection of that. For example, there was a large basin of water for ritual washing. It represented the oceans. The seven lights on the menorah, or lampstand, represented the sun, the moon, and the five planets that people could see. There were also images of trees and flowers, 
representations of angels carved or woven in various places. In other words, all of creation. The destruction of the temple, then, would have been symbolic of the destruction of the whole universe, which the temple was an image of. And therefore, it would have been symbolic of the coming day of the Lord. And so in our gospel today, Jesus' disciples ask that question that everyone asks. When will this be? What will be the sign this is about to take place? And Jesus' response to his disciples is clear. Anything else is simply in direct contradiction to the Gospels and the clear teaching of Jesus. First, Jesus says, do not be led astray. In every age, from the very beginnings of the church to our own day, people have tried to search in various world events and scripture passages taken out of context for some kind of hidden code about the end of the world. The time is near. To this tendency, Jesus says, do not go after them. Next, Jesus says, do not be terrified. Scary things are happening in our world. But there's never been a time in history when people didn't think they were living in the end times. So to this tendency of ours towards fear, Jesus says, do not be terrified. And lastly, Jesus says that before all this occurs, that is, before the day of the Lord comes, you have a task to accomplish. <coughs> this will give you an opportunity to testify. The Greek word there for testimony is martyrion, where we get our English word martyr from. The word martyr today refers to a person who dies for their beliefs, but a martyr is simply someone who testifies, someone who gives witness. Now, recognize that for some of us, we would rather die than have to give witness of our, to our faith before certain people, especially before a potentially unreceptive, let alone hostile audience. But Jesus tells us he will give us the words and the wisdom Remember, wisdom is one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. He will give us the wisdom we need to fulfill our task, our vocation. And this is the task. This is the vocation of all the baptized, whether we're two or 92. We will not all be called to give up our lives, but we are all called to be martyrs, that is, witnesses to allow the gifts of the Holy Spirit we received in baptism that were strengthened in confirmation to shine forth in us as the day of the Lord draws near. Come, Lord Jesus.